Today we're going to be continuing our study of genomic engineering. We're going to go into the section known as mixology. And what we're going to be learning about is we're going to be talking about how we can take genes from one organism and insert them into another organism. We're going to go through the steps of how this is done. We're going to talk about these things called sticky ends and restriction enzymes and why they're super important. We're going to be talking about how bacteria are used in this case and a part of bacteria known as plasmid, something we haven't talked about before. And then finally, we're going to be talking about uh, other different types of genes that we can insert into other organisms, not just bacteria, and other types of genetic engineering, and we're going to be focusing on cloning, cloning, which has nothing to do with the inserting gene stuff that we're talking about here. So in this idea of what we call mixology, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking around for a gene that we want to put into a different organism. And once we find the gene, we're going to cut the gene using special enzymes called restriction enzymes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we're going to cut the genes that we want, and we're going to cut the DNA of the organisms that we want to put the gene in. So we're going to cut two different things. And once we've got the organism's DNA cut, we're going to take our new gene and insert it into a different organism's chromosomes. Then once we've got that done, we're going to take the chromosome and stick it back into the organism. Why is this going to be important? Because if a new organism has a different gene, even a gene from a different species, it's going to assume that that gene is its own, which means it's going to do protein synthesis on this gene, even though this gene doesn't belong to this organism. That means it's going to make the new protein. And we can do this because we all have the same genetic code. All living things use DNA and RNA, so it's all made of the same four bases. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, one reason we want to do this is we can cause bacteria to create medicines. It's going to allow organisms to produce new proteins, and some of those proteins are medicines. For example, insulin, human insulin. We can take the human insulin gene from a human, insert it into a bacteria, and now the bacteria is making human insulin. Or we could do human growth hormone, or we can do a blood clotting factor. So genetic engineering is where we take a gene, DNA, from one organism, and we insert that gene, the DNA, into another organism so that that, new, that other organism is creating the same protein, expressing the same trait as our original organism. We're going to take genes from one organism and stick it into another organism. Now, it's really important to do this, so we have to have a chemical called a restriction enzyme. A restriction enzyme is like a pair of scissors, and these scissors are going to cut DNA. Now, the reason why restriction enzymes exist, it turns out that uh, bacteria, that's what this is a picture of down here, that's a bacteria, they have viruses specific to bacteria. They're actually called bacteriophages, this, this weird little thing right here, that's a bacteriophage. And when it attacks a bacteria, it injects its genetic material into the bacteria, it injects its DNA into the bacteria. So there's the bacterial DNA, there's the foreign invading viral DNA. And bacteria have these restriction enzymes, which will just chop up this DNA into little pieces so that they're no longer useful. Now, there's a way that which the uh, DNA protects itself from being chopped up. But basically, that's, that's what the original purpose of restriction enzymes were, to protect bacteria from incoming viruses. And these restriction enzymes actually cut DNA at very specific sites. So the enzymes will travel through the DNA and look for a specific set of bases. And once it sees those bases, that triggers the enzyme to cut the DNA at that point. What's important about this is the DNA doesn't just chop it straight through. It's not going to cut it straight across. The restriction enzymes aren't just going to cut the DNA straight down the middle here. It's not going to be like just makes a cut and just calls the DNA, cuts it right there. It cuts in this weird way where it cuts part of one chain but doesn't cut part of the other chain, and it leaves what are called sticky ends. What's going to happen here is, let's say the um, restriction enzyme, uh, this is a restriction enzyme called ECHO-R1, 
it's going to look for the sequence G A A T T C, which is matched up with C T T A A G. It's going to search the entire genome and it's looking for this set. And once it finds this set, it can bind to this specific set of proteins and it's going to make it cut down through the first chain, then across, then down to the second chain. So it's not going straight through, it's cutting this weird angle here. So that when it separates, it kind of looks like this, where you've got a G A A T T C, which is not paired up anymore. And on this strain, you've got C T T A A G, which is not paired up anymore. And these two ends right here, these little ends that are sticking off that are no longer paired up, are now referred to as sticky ends. The reason why they're called sticky ends is they will help us stick together the pieces of DNA. And the idea behind this is that if you take a strand of DNA and you cut it with a specific restriction enzyme, you leave these sticky ends. But then if you cut another DNA from another organism, you're going to create the same sticky ends. <coughs> See how this, uh, this yellow, this is the, the, the chromosome of the organism we're trying to insert the gene into. Here's the gene we're trying to insert it into. You see how this has got G-A-A-T-T-C on top here? And when we cut the yellow guy, the yellow guy is going to have the sticky end on the bottom, that C-T-T-A-A-G. So this sticky end of this chromosome will match this top sticky end of this extra gene we want to put in. And then these two will naturally attract each other. G bonds with C, A bonds with T. So there's no, there's nothing special we have to do. Just put the ends near each other and they'll latch onto each other and glue themselves together. So now what we've got here is we've got the chromosome of the organism that we, that normally didn't have the gene. And we have the gene. <clears throat> so because the restriction enzyme cuts the same way, on all types of DNA, it creates these ends, which we can bind together later on. So let me show you how this works. Let's pretend that this is part of, say, human DNA. And this blue thing right here, this part right here, this right here is the gene for something like, let's call it insulin. If we can, this gene, when it's red, it creates insulin. But what we're going to do is we're going to cut this gene out using our restriction enzyme and then we're going to insert it into some bacterial dna so the first thing we do is our restriction enzyme uh, look there it says there's restriction enzyme this is going to go along until it finds this sequence here so it's reading all these base pairs and then it goes hey that's the sequence i'm looking for and what it's going to do is it's going to cut here it's going to cut here and it's going to cut across here so i'm going to do that right now it's going to cut here. It's going to cut across here. And then it's going to cut across here. There, it's cut the DNA. And what it's going to do is it's going to travel along. It sees the gene, and there could be like whole bunches of other DNA base pairs in between here and in between here. But eventually it's going to cut, go through the uh, gene itself <clears throat> not reading the code but then some point later on it's going to see that same nonsense repeat code dna over here and it's going to cut it again again it's going to cut up here it's going to cut down here it's going to cut across here so the restriction enzyme is picking specific spots to cut our dna so here was our DNA beforehand. Our restriction enzyme came in, cut here, cut here. And now what we have is the enzyme, the um, enzyme has cut out the particular gene for insulin. And we've got these two sticky ends here. So we're kind of done with the human DNA right now. We don't need that anymore, but we're going to keep this right guy right here. So the next thing we'll do is we'll take DNA from bacteria and we'll give it the exact same restriction enzyme. So this restriction enzyme, again, the ECHOR1 restriction enzyme, is looking for that GAATTC. So as it's going along here, it's going to find the GAATTC. It's going to bond here just like it did before. Cut. Cut. 
cut and cut. So now our bacterial DNA has now been cut. Now, if we introduce this enzyme into this bacteria, look what happens. Because it was cut the same way, this sticky end matches up with this sticky end and they bond together. The base pairs just attach to each other with that hydrogen bonding stuff we talked about. And this guy bonds here. So now we have bacterial DNA that's got the human insulin gene inside of it. Now this DNA is going to work just fine. All the other bacterial proteins down here and all the other bacterial proteins up here are all going to be red. It's going to go through protein synthesis just like normal, except now it's going to start reading this new gene and start producing this new protein. So here it is one more time. This is the gene we want. This is like the human insulin gene right here. And we're going to chop it. We're going to chop it. Doesn't have a quick cut the way I cut it, but it's still the same idea. So we've got these sticky ends here. And then we're going to take the bacterial DNA and we're going to cut that as well. And we separate the two of them together. We're going to take this yellow piece and stick it into this purple piece. And the two sticky ends are going to actually match up with each other. That's the sticky end. One line's from the bacteria, one line's from the, um, the gene itself. And they're going to stick to each other. And now what we've got is one long chain that's got bacterial DNA, human insulin DNA, bacterial DNA in it. So now what's going to happen is this strip of bacterial DNA with the human insulin gene inside of it is now going to be read by the bacteria's protein synthesis mechanism. And it's going to make the bacterial proteins like it's supposed to. But when it gets to this section and starts undergoing protein synthesis with this section, it's going to produce a string of amino acids that's going to be human insulin, identical to the insulin that our bodies produce. It's the same gene. It's going to make the same amino acids. It's going to make the same protein. So what's the use of a bacteria making one strand of insulin? Well, don't forget, this can be copied. This DNA can be copied over and over and over again. We can make lots and lots of molecules of insulin from one bacteria. So if we have enough bacteria together, all producing human insulin, we can harvest the human insulin from the, from the bacteria. And now we have insulin that we can use for people who need it for diabetics. So we're doing all of this with bacteria. Why bacteria? What is so important about bacteria? They have a lot of advantages for us to use with this type of genetic engineering. First off, they're prokaryotes. They're one-celled organisms. They don't have any organelles, which means they don't have a nucleus, which means it's easy to get to their DNA. Also, since they reproduce by mitosis, they're going to make exact copies of themselves. We don't have to worry about any type of crossing over or any type of switching of genes. You know that um, uh, things that uh, undergo asexual reproduction make exact copies of themselves. So once we get the new gene inserted into this bacteria, it's going to make exact copies of itself. They're also very easy to grow. I actually used to do this when I was at Syracuse University. All you have to do is uh, create a little plastic dish filled with this gelatin-like substance that uh, the bacteria feed off of, put a little bit of bacteria in there, cover it up, stick it in an incubator, and wait. Every 20 minutes, the bacteria double in size. That's their generations. So if we were doing this in like pigs and cows and mice, in order to see a new organism that can produce this insulin, we would have to wait for the organism to be born, to grow up, to actually mate. Then we would have to wait for its offspring, and then its offspring would have to start growing very, very, very long time. All of that is done with bacteria in 20 minutes. And as soon as the bacteria are created through binary fission, they can start producing our new protein. So bacteria 
have, are very simple organisms, no nucleus for us to bother with. They make exact copies of themselves, so we don't have to worry about losing this new gene, and they grow really fast compared to other organisms, doubling every 20 minutes. Another advantage that bacteria have is the, bacterium ge the bacterial genome, the DNA of bacteria, has got two other important things in it. Number one, the DNA is generally one circle of chromosome. There's the bacterial DNA right there. It's a circle of DNA. There's no nucleus around it. There's no um, nothing protecting this thing here. And there's only one copy of this. Remember when we do sexual reproduction, we have extra copies. We have two copies of a gene. You have one from mom, you have one from dad. Well, bacteria only have one parent, so they have only one copy of the DNA. So bacteria are actually considered haploid because they only contain one copy of their DNA. And there's no nucleus, so this little strand is floating around all by itself. So bacteria are very simple. Bacteria only have one copy of their DNA. But the other important part of bacteria is this little guy right here called a plasmid. Let's talk about what else is in a bacteria besides just the straight DNA. There's these extra little pieces of DNA known as plasmids. What's a plasmid? A plasmid is an extra circle of DNA. It's in bacteria. It's extra pieces of DNA in these little circles, and they replicate by themselves. So the DNA, while this DNA here is replicating itself, these little circles of DNA, these little plasmids are also replicating themselves. So we've got this being replicated, but we've got these other little circles here, these sim very simple small circles replicating as well. What's on these plasmids? Extra genes. Now these are extra genes that bacteria can use, so it's not, uh, if we don't have the plasmid, the bacteria is going to die. It's extra DNA with some extra genes on it. And the other thing is, bacteria can actually get together in a process known as conjugation, where they actually attach to each other, and they can swap plasmids. So in other words, a plasmid from one cell is actually able to enter into another cell through conjugation. So the bacteria are kind of used to giving and taking these different plasmids. It's, it's kind of like bacterial sex, because what you're doing is you're giving other genetic material to another bacteria to change that bacteria a little bit. One of the things that this is most important for bacteria is involved in antibiotic resistance, whereas on this little plasmid right here might be a gene that stops antibiotics from killing the bacteria. If this cell can replicate this plasmid and then give this plasmid to his buddies that are around them, they're all going to be protected from the antibiotic. So, plasmids, extra pieces of DNA, they replicate themselves, and they can be easily moved into and out of bacteria because bacteria are kind of used to doing that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through the same process with the restriction enzymes as we did before, but we're going to work on plasmids. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of bacteria and we're going to get their plasmids out of the bacteria. And once we've got the plasmid, we're going to hit it with the restriction enzyme, which is going to cut it. At the same time, in another organism, we're going to cut that organism's DNA with our restriction enzyme. And just like we showed you before, it's going to leave these complementary sticky ends here and here, and there's going to be two right here and here. So the circle of DNA is actually going to open up, and we're going to add this into the DNA. And now we've got this. There's the old bacterial plasmid. There's the new section of the gene we wanted in, in there. This is what is known as a recombinant DNA plasmid. Recombinant means we've recombined DNA from two different organisms. Whenever you hear the term recombinant, that means 
combining DNA from two different things. Now, another word you should be aware of is this term vector. What vector means is it's the way in which things go from place to place. For example, if we were talking about um, vegetables on a farm, getting to a grocery store, what would be the vector that gets the vegetables to the store? It'd be a truck. It's the thing that moves the stuff you want. Well, in this case, the thing that's going to transfer our recombinant DNA is our plasmid. That's our vector. Um, another way in biology, if you start thinking about something like malaria, which is a disease that's caused by a particular parasite that lives in a mosquito. Well, the mosquito is the vector. The mosquito is the thing that carries the disease from organism to organism and moves it around. But in this case, we are using this plasmid as our vector. And then because bacteria naturally are able to absorb different plasmids, we can easily get our recombinant plasmid into our bacteria. And once it's in the bacteria, remember these guys are self-replicating. So even before this guy replicates, this guy has made a copy of himself already. And now look, we've got two copies of this extra gene in there. So then all we have to do now is we just have to wait for the bacteria to start growing. Every 20 minutes, this guy doubles and we'll have two and then we'll have four and eight and 16. And all the time that they're doubling, their recombinant plasmids are also reproducing. So we've got lots and lots and lots of those little red and blue circles in here already. And every little piece of red that you see in here is going to make insulin. We just let this grow for a while, and then the, we have a particular method in which we can go in and pull out the protein that we want, which in this case is the insulin, and we've got our insulin. So we can cause bacteria to recreate proteins that we consider important, such as the human growth hormone, the insulin, and that blood clotting factor we mentioned before. And while it seems that this technique is, is really tricky, the process is really well known. So this can be done fairly easily because we know how to do all of these steps. We've refined all of these different steps to create like bacteria that are going to produce things that we want. Now, we're not only talking about taking genes and cutting them and sticking them in bacteria to grow them. We're also going to be talking about how we're going to be using genes in different organisms. And now we get back to our GMOs that we talked about before, our genetically modified organisms. We'll take an organism and we'll add genes to it for proteins from other species to see if we can improve or protect the particular organism. A couple of examples here, protecting crops from insects, Bt corn. What we'll do is we'll have a gene for a bacterial toxin in the corn. Now, the toxin doesn't hurt us at all. We don't even notice it, but it kills bacteria. It kills um, it kills a particular type of organism, rather not bacteria, but it kills a particular type of organism, the corn borer caterpillar, this guy right here, which goes in and destroys corn. Well, now as this guy goes in and tries to destroy the corn, because of the genetic engineering, there's a toxin in here that'll kill this. So our corn survives. We have also taken a gene from a flounder. Now, flounders get to live in super cold temperatures, much colder than other organisms can survive in, because they have basically antifreeze within them, a chemical that's going to keep the water within their bodies from freezing at these lower temperatures. So what we'll do is we'll harvest this particular gene for this antifreeze, and we'll stick it in strawberries. The strawberries start producing the gene start producing, start reproducing the gene and start producing the antifreeze. Now, this particular chemical has been found not to har harm humans at all. It doesn't interact with us at all. So it's not like you're eating antifreeze. But because of that, the strawberries get to grow in colder weather. Normally what happens is as soon as you get a freeze, your plants start dying off. Uh, anybody who works on a farm or has a garden always knows you have to be careful about the first frost or if there's a uh, um, a frost in early spring that can kill your plants. Well, these strawberries are going to be able to survive because they have this gene 
that we put in there from a flounder. Another thing we can do, not so much to protect, but to help us out, is we can improve the quality of food. There's a type of rice called golden rice. We have implanted within the golden rice genome the gene for producing vitamin A. So the rice is going to grow just like it normally does, but it's also going to create the same chemical, vitamin A, that we need. So now when we're eating this rice, we're also getting an increased supply of vitamin A. So now the rice is more nutritional for us. Here's some other uses. These are, if you're wondering why you saw a picture of the goat uh, shooting spiders out of itself, that's actually a thing. What they've done is they've inserted um, a protein for spiders webbing, and we can get it from goat's milk. And what do we use the webbing for? We can make things, you know, spider webbing is very, very strong. Um, it can be used to actually make bulletproof vests. We can insert genes into cows that are going to produce human milk. Now, the best thing for babies is always to breastfeed. That can always happen. So a lot of mothers eventually switch to use what's called formula, which is like imitation human breast milk. Well, if we can get cows to produce actual human breast milk, that's going to be even healthier than formula. And they're also working on getting pigs and sheep by implanting them with specific genes to actually grow human organisms, human organs. And we would use those organs for transplants. This is a lot trickier. There's a lot more going on with um, human organs because all humans are slightly different. But that's another possibility that could come up in the future. Uh, another example down here, for example, is um, Here's salmon that are naturally grown in uh, like big tanks, farmed salmon looks like this. But if we genetically modify the salmon, we can make them much, much larger. So instead of getting one fish weighing 2.8 pounds, now one fish weighs more than twice what it did before. And both fish grow in the same amount of time. We can make more food through this guy than we can from this guy. So now we're into the last part. We're into the part where we're uh, not talking about inserting genes anymore. Well, not really inserting specific genes anymore. What we're talking about is a form of cloning. And how this works is we will take cells from an organism that, wants to be that, that we want to have cloned. And we'll take skin cells. Why skin cells? Because every cell of this pig has the exact same DNA. So we can take any cell we want from the pig. Skin cells are really easy to get, so we're going to use skin cells. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the nucleus of this skin cell, and we're going to take an egg cell, in this case an egg cell from a pig, but the egg cell from a pig we're going to actually um, remove its DNA. So if we've got a female pig, we take the egg from the female pig, and that nucleus right there gets removed, so now it's empty. And we will insert this nucleus into that egg cell. And then we insert that egg cell, or we actually we, we induce this egg cell to start growing, because it's got a full complement. Right here, it's getting the diploid, it's got diploid DNA put into the egg, so now the egg doesn't need to fuse with sperm cells. We force this cell to start growing. It starts growing into an embryo. Long before that, it's injected back into a, a pig, and the pig will produce an animal similar to the animal being cloned. So even though it looks like sexual reproduction, it really isn't because we're taking all the DNA from one organism and sticking it into another organism. This actually has been done before, not too recently, about 20 or so years ago. It was a sheep called Dolly. They took a body cell from one organ, one sheep, and they took an egg cell from a different sheep, got rid of the DNA, and put the DNA from the body cell right into the egg. So the egg didn't need any more sperm, so then they induced it to start growing, then they stuck it back into a sheep, a different sheep, and out pops a sheep that was identical to the original sheep they took it from. Now, 
Dolly didn't live a completely normal life. It ended up dying a little bit early, but it still showed how you could actually take DNA from one organism and recreate an organism with the exact same DNA. So why would you want to do this? Well, of course, there's all those movies that shows humans being cloned and then you have exact copies and then you can clone a whole bunch of little Hitlers and whatever you want. That was actually in a movie, uh, The Boys from Brazil, where they cloned Hitler a whole bunch of different times to grow a bunch of Hitlers. But human cloning, uh, it's actually considered illegal. Uh, it's very, very difficult to do. But one possible thing we can do is we might be able to bring back extinct species, such as a woolly mammoth. This is what they're working on, is trying to create a woolly mammoth. So they found frozen woolly mammoths with intact DNA. And the whole plan is to take the DNA from the woolly mammoth and uh, take an egg cell from a regular elephant and then put the woolly mammoth DNA into the elephant and then the regular elephant gives birth to a woolly mammoth. That's a way in which we can supposedly bring back these extinct species. There's a lot of issues and problems with that because whatever we're injecting this, this egg cell into with the woolly mammoth DNA, it's not going to have the same environment as an actual woolly mammoth. So is the organism that's born going to be looking exactly like the woolly mammoths we had before? We don't know. There's a lot of work being going on to try to do this sort of thing, but that's why they sort of do this thing. So that's the mixology part of genetic engineering. What we did was we talked about what we're going to be doing. We're going to be cutting genes out of one organism and sticking it into another organism. We talked about the steps of doing this and what these sticky ends were, how the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA to create these sticky ends. And we talked about how we use bacterial DNA as our vector, as our transport mechanism. And the plasmids in the DNA, that's the important part of uh, the DNA that we play around with. That's the stuff that we inject the genes into. Then the last thing we talked about was other inserted genes, um, where we can insert genes into not just bacteria, but to other organisms for various reasons. And then we finally ended up talking about cloning, which is kind of like inserting all the genes from one organism into an empty cell to cause that cell to grow up to be the original organism. So that's about it. We've got a lab coming up which uh, goes through this process here. Aside from that, if you have questions, please contact me.